We are with seven-time Emmy winner Terry Jastro. He worked for ABC Sports under the tutelage of the legendary Rune Ardledge, where he became the youngest network producer director in history. His credits include one Super Bowl, 62 major golf championships, six Olympic Games, including the opening and closing ceremonies of the 1984 Olympics, which were watched by an estimated one billion people. Turning to writing Jastro's The Trial of George W. Bush postulates what would have happened if Bush were arrested and tried for high crimes over his weapons of mass destruction claim, weapons that were never discovered. His second book is When Boomers Came of Age and will be released shortly. He's currently working on a third, My Life, My Way. Please welcome the amazing, legendary Terry Jastro. <laughs> Hi, Zach. <laughs> it's great to have you here. I'm very excited about uh, talking to you about a variety of things. Let's start what it was like for you to be involved in the 1984 Olympics. Well, at the time I, I had moved to Los Angeles and uh, the idea of, of, uh, of uh, directing uh, and producing the opening and closing ceremonies of the Olympics uh, was something very, very special. Um, I had I had done uh, I think four or five Olympics before um, under the great tutelage of Rune Arledge, who of course was the president of ABC Sports and executive producer, and ABC Sports uh, did all the Olympics over there for a span of uh, I don't know four or five years, uh, Summer Olympics and and Winter Olympics, and um, he was a great showman and uh, a fabulous guy. And um, even though I did uh, some events as well, but I did the opening and closing ceremonies, I think of, of uh, like six Olympics, including the Summer Olympics in 1984. And I just love it when the people of the world come together, get gather together with a common cause. And uh, the Olympics is really great uh, because it, it causes that to happen. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Olympics for sure. Uh, what about working with, the legendary uh, Rune Outlet Arledge. What was it like to to just be with them on a daily basis? Well, he was a he was a very refined man and hugely intelligent. He went to Columbia, uh, and he um, uh, he he was very attuned to storytelling. You know, even uh, in the creation of ABC's Wide World of Sports. Uh, the opening mantra, which he co-wrote with, uh, with the great Jim McKay. It is uh, uh, spanning the globe to bring a constant variety of sports, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, <laughs> the human drama of athletic competition. Now, to this day, that gives me goosebumps. Uh, but that was written by Rune, and that was the essence uh, of of. Uh, of the storytelling of, of a wide world of sports and everything we did at ABC Sports, including the Olympics and golf events and all of that. It's the human drama, the story of what people go through, the, the th thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. And he just um, uh, taught us uh, and toured us uh, in, in that regard. And uh, it's a it was truly a, a, a blessing and a treasure to work with him for all those years. And, and those of us old enough to remember definitely know the agony of defeat where you have the skier just like falling all over the place. And yeah, the every, ski jumper. Right. And everybody, right. And everybody in the living room would be watching like, ow, that had to hurt. Is that guy still alive? Uh, you do know, you know what happened to that man? There's an interesting story about that, Zach, that few people know. So the, the, the announcer uh, uh, who was calling the event live, the ski jumper that came in and he, he zoomed off the ski thing and tumbled off, off of it was Bud Palmer. And uh, he, 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 we were talking to him, to Bud, about a number of years ago. And he said that guy that looked like he broke his neck he, they saw, saw him in a disco that night, <laughs> that same guy. <laughs> That's great. Hey, did you ever get to work with the great Howard Cosell? Oh, I did. I did many uh, events with Howard Cosell. Back, back in the day, this would be, uh, I don't know, the, the 70s, I guess. Uh, Rune noticing the, 
the uh, continuing success of 60 Minutes, the news magazine show at CBS, uh, and it kind of s- s- set the standard of what could happen in a magazine show. So Rune wanted to do a sports magazine show. And because Howard was both a commentator and a, a, a really a good journalist as well, uh, he created the Howard Cosell Sports Magazine Show. And um, I remember one day I came into the office and Rune's, uh, sec- Rune's secretary called and said, can you come over and, and, uh, and have a word with Rune? And I was freaked out because Rune was a bit of a night guy and he never came in until like mid morning because he, you know, uh, had had long nights and uh, he was like calling me in at, you know, before nine o'clock. And I went in and um, and he said, OK, we're going to start a sports magazine show. Howard's going to host it. It's going to be the Howard Costell Sports Magazine Show. And when we came to who was going to produce and direct it, he thinks all of our producers and directors are phonies and no talent <laughs> and even idiots. And he doesn't know you. He doesn't know who you are. So guess what? You're the producer and director of the Howard Costell Sports Magazine Show. And uh, Howard did, did did not only television, but he, he did a, a speaking of everything uh, on radio. He did a radio show, a three to five minute show every day. And um, and the ABC building, which was on 54th and 6th in Manhattan in New York, uh, the, the ABC Sports was on the 28th floor. But the radio uh, uh, guys were down on the sixth floor, which is where Howard's um, office was. So I went down, what went down there, and, and walked into his room, and uh, and said, "Hello, Mr. Cosell. My name is Terry Jastro, and I'm the producer of the Howard Cosell Sports Magazine show. What's the first show?" And and I said, "Well, sit down there." And then, oh, we did lots of st- stuff. Kurt Flood about about the. Um, reserve uh, uh, clause in baseball. I mean, I could go on and on. I'll I'll shut up. But it was quite an education and quite an experience. Well, all of us broadcasters, including myself, all had our imitation of Howard Cosell. I mean, we'd all try it. Uh, And uh, the, the stories that grew around Howard in the broadcast community are, you know, there's so many different ones. I used to work with Scott Muni. And Scott Muni used to be the voice, ABC Monday Night Football. And that's the only job I really wanted when I was growing up. I wanted to be that guy. Unfortunately, in a way, it's still on ABC, but it's all ESPN. And uh, yeah. the magic to me of ABC Monday Night Football is gone. And, and yeah. uh, you know, without Howard, without Dandy Don Meredith and uh, Frank Gifford, it's just, it, it, I don't think it'll ever be duplicated. But anyway. Yeah, let's move on. I, un- I understand that you yeah. always wanted to be a writer. I think that's one of the toughest jobs because I-, I know anybody listening or watching will say, yeah, I've tried to write a lot of things and I just sit there like an idiot, not knowing what to put down. So what made you want to be a writer and what's your secret sauce? Well, I have a <laughs> thanks for that. The, the, how secret it is and how good is the sauce is for others to <laughs> others to adjudicate. But uh, I've always loved uh, storytelling, you know, which which uh, 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 began uh, as a young producer and director at ABC Sports, as I was saying. And um, uh, the, also, I like to write things that I think matter, not 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 just recreational pieces and recreational writing and 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 reading but things that that that, that matter and uh, i've written uh, uh plays and screenplays and novels uh and 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 uh, uh non-fiction books as well um and um i i don't i don't consider it uh labor i consider it art like a sculptor would sculpt or a, a painter would paint and um, uh, yeah, I wrote uh, the, the trial of George W. Bush as an example. In fact, I was hoping to be able to tell you this. This is the trial of George W. Bush, uh, and it's a it's a, obviously it's fiction, but it imagines that he is um, abducted off uh, the a golf course in Scotland, the 
course, in, in St. Andrews, Scotland, and transported to the International Criminal Court to stand uh, uh, trial for war crimes and crimes against humanity in connection to the Iraq war. And it's a whole um, very, very uh, specifically uh, researched uh, with um, uh, international criminal court uh, lawyers and experts guiding me about it. And uh, he's put on trial for uh, the uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and in, humanity in, 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 the, in connection with the Iraq war. When you wrote that book and it was published, um, did you get any pushback or did you get any threats? Did you get any uh, hate mail? About, like, what, what was the result of that? Yeah, uh, uh, honestly, I got, um, uh, I, I, there's nothing that ever came into my consciousness. There, there was no letters, nobody said anything. Uh, but what I, I got a, a, a rather huge and surprising amount of, uh, of uh, support and appreciation and congratulations from people. Uh, you know, a lot, lot of, lot of people my age uh, were, were young guys during the Vietnam War, and that's a, that was a terrible war, the Vietnam War. For the, we don't have to get into that because that's 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 just another story. But when you look at the Iraq war, so, so, so 9-11 happens in 2001. I, I, I probably get the years wrong. Yeah, 9-11, 2001. Right, right. So, uh, uh, so Bush becomes president and he's, he's, his main thing is, is, is bringing the perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks to justice. And he goes out with all of the military and the, the, the spies and all that to try to get Osama bin Laden uh, in Afghanistan, and he can't, he can't get it. And after a period of time, he in effect panics and says that Saddam Hussein was had some uh, 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 complicity with Osama bin Laden and begins to uh, turn the attention of the U.S. military to Iraq and, and, and wages the Iraq war, which takes, you know, seven and a half years and spends hundreds of millions of dollars of the of U.S. Uh, Treasury to fight that war. Um, and, and Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with the, with the 9-11 uh, attacks. So that, that, that's, that's what I, I think that people, the writers especially, artists have got to call attention to the, the, the criminality and the, 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 the lack of necessity for the wars, Vietnam War, uh, uh, Iraq War, because if the, if the populace doesn't really understand it and, 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 and opposes it, then we're going to have more uh, wars in the future. Yeah, I think that sometimes we get on the side of cheerleading for whatever group we belong to or whatever political aisle we're from. And whatever that leader says, yeah, let's go for it because our leader is the best. Instead of just pausing and saying, no, well, wait a minute, hold on here for a second. Uh, in regard to what happened with the Gulf War, uh, the second Gulf War, if you want to call it that after 9-11, we immediately go after Afghanistan. Now, there were, I think, 13, I think 13 hijackers were some from Saudi Arabia. So our beef maybe should have been with the Saudis. Now, when you look down the road, it's interesting. The Saudis, I don't think, really got along with the Iraqis. So I just wonder, like, in this circle of what's going on with these world leaders of how much is just contrived in order to get people to go along with this plan. And, and maybe sometimes we're the pawn and we don't even realize that. Yeah, uh, I think it would be important for American citizens to understand what the military industrial complex is. It's a it's a it's a, a partnership between big business and the military because there's huge amounts of money. I mean, it's like 12 zeros worth of money that they pay a tax tax pay, payers dollars to foam up war and have to fight war when we have so many actual problems 
in our country with regard to climate change and, and education and poverty and uh, crime and all the things that we should be spending our treasury on, as opposed to these things where we're fighting wars on the other side of the world. I would agree with that and, you know, make them accountable for all the money that they do spend that ends up missing. It's it's amazing how that evaporates. Yeah. And it, you know something, uh, the, the thing about it, Zach, it's not going to happen unless the citizenry, the people stand up. We've had wars in the United States almost from from the beginning. Hmm. And if, if, if the common man is not going to be sensitized to the fact that the U.S. government and the military continue to wage wars that are unnecessary, that are cost that are cost tremendous percentage of of our of our treasury, as opposed to using that money for education and poverty and uh, you know, global warming and, and all the things that actually help humanity, then I think we're destined to more wars in the future. I would agree with that, including what's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, it's amazing to me how many people just go, well, it's a just war. I'm like, no, no, we, we, there's no such thing as really a just war when you think about it. But we'll table that because uh, I want to get focused on more about what you're doing right now, uh, just to put that thought out there. How about how about this? We challenge anybody who might disagree with us to use their critical thinking skills and try to find out more information on their own instead of being how told how to think and feel through social media. Fair enough. I'm with you. <laughs> so uh, you wrote something else that's really interesting. It was a, a screenplay, uh, the Jane Fonda play. The trial yes. of Jane Fonda. Uh, yes. People just uh, might not be old enough to remember what was happening uh, during the Vietnam War that landed her in trouble with the, I guess, I'm going to use this term, moral majority. Well, uh, the United States um, got into the Vietnam War and uh, uh, on, on uh, s s suspect reasons. Uh, and then actually I forget what it was, but there was a, there was a, the a, an incident. Tonkin, the Gulf of Tonkin. The Gulf of Tonkin, that's exactly right. And th th uh, 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 it, when you understand what actually happened at the Gulf of Tonkin, and it's it's been very specifically uh, uh, researched and presented. But the U.S. Uh, 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 ship, ship battleships got into a place they shouldn't have been, but they shouldn't have been, and they, they were they were fleeing from it, and uh, the uh, the shots were fired, and the Gulf of Tonkin was the pre the precept. Uh, that actually waged the, the Vietnam War, started the v Vietnam War. And we spent just huge amounts of, of, of dollars and spent, you, you know, I, th I think there were, and the, uh, this again, my memory is not what it should be, but I think there was like 50,000 Americans that were died and or were wounded in that war and countless more Vietnamese people. And for what? The, 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 the war became, what is this war about? We're fighting this war over there, spending our treasuries, killing our boys, and to what end? And Jane Fonda, who was then and certainly even remains today, uh, was a, 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 a person who is just uh, hated wars and loved peace, went over there in the middle of the war and actually uh, to try to find out what it was and we got got caught uh, sitting on an anti-aircraft uh, uh, gun, uh, which created a whole uh, controversy in the state. When she came back, she actually started talking about journalists, et cetera, about how how uh, the, the war is is unfair. We shouldn't be doing it. It's unjust. We're spending all our more. And you can you can actually track the end of the Vietnam War to fund a going over to war the, to, the, to Vietnam and coming back and telling her story. And so I wrote a book about it. 
That's fantastic. Uh, imagining that she's she's put it put on a uh, trial for it. So that uh, book, along with the uh, the trial of George W. Bush, is available at terryjastro.com, Correct. Correct, and and not and uh, you can Google it or Amazon. <laughs> Thank goodness for Amazon. <laughs> and your next one, My Life, My Way, you want to give us a little uh, tease of what that's about? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I feel that um, there's a lot of things that I have learned. I'm, I'm, I'm a septuagenarian. Let's just leave it at that. I'm in my 70s. And um, I feel like uh, I've, I've learned a lot of really interesting things. Some of the some of the lessons were uh, learned easy, and some were hard to get and hard to make. Uh, but I I go through uh, the most important elements of my life and analyze the thing about what happened in the storytelling that because ultimately it's got to be interesting and entertaining to read, and and tell the stories of of, of the events and the people. Uh, uh, that I that I worked with in a way that I can try to make the story interesting. I'm a, I, I, there's chapters about Ethel Kennedy, cha chapters about Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell, chapters about uh, um, uh, uh, Rafer Johnson. A lot of interesting people, and and I just try to do it so the storytelling becomes entertaining. And the message becomes educational, and I'm very happy with that. I'm just finishing it. In fact, it's at the the, the proofreader now, but it'll be out, I'm sure, in a few months. But it that's it. It's uh, um, uh, my life, uh, my way. Well, obviously, if you're in your 70s, that makes you a boomer like me. I'm the I'm like your little brother boomer. I was <laughs> born at the end of '64, so I still count. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm part of a nowhere generation because I can't really identify with either uh, the, the Gen X or the boomers. But anyway, but anyway, I was raised by the World War II guys. Uh, boomers Came of Age is certainly a timely book. It's out right now. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I, I've, uh, I had such a great uh, time uh, writing that story. Um, it's a story uh, that takes place in the year of 1969, uh, coming as it does um, at the end of the 60s, which is arguably one of the most um, eventful and turbulent de decades in all of American history. Uh, we're dealing with racial uh, uh, issues. We're de dealing with uh, the Vietnam War, we're dealing with drugs. Uh, uh, it, it, there's a huge amount of uh, uh, co controversy. Women's lib. Do you know that, you know that uh, in 1969, uh, unescorted women were not allowed in the lobby of the Plaza Hotel in New York City among a lot of other hotels. So we follow we follow eight baby boomers, and we meet each one of the eight eight uh, uh, baby boomers uh, individually. Men, women, uh, black, white, uh, smart, not smart. Where they're they're very uh, baby boomers, all coming of age in the year of 1969. And in a very interesting kind of math mathematical way, they begin to meet each other. And at the end of the novel, end of the story, they're all at the same event at the same time. And the book ends when uh, uh, when the, the ball drops in New York and 1969 is over. And we start with 1970, the, 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 the year and the next decade. That's when the novel finishes. So they didn't all meet together at Woodstock, man? The what? I said that they all get together at Woodstock. I was, you know. The oh, yeah. The, the two of them went. Two yeah. of them went to Woodstock. Woodstock. <laughs> I some, you, you don't write a book about baby boomers in 1969 without somebody going to Woodstock. <laughs> well, without everybody saying they were there, whether they were there or not. That's true, too. Yeah, there's some, there's some question about well, that. But thank I, you, Terry. I, Thank you, Terry Jastrow, uh, for spending time with us. I'm really excited about all the books that you have. 
Looking forward to my life, my way. Going to pick up a copy when boomers come of age, because I, I think that that's fantastic. Being a musical guy as I am, you got Jane Fonda play the trial of Jane Fonda, which is a really interesting perspective of what happened in the Vietnam War. And of course, the trial of George W. Bush. <laughs> oh, you're the greatest, Zach. Thank you very much. <laughs>